So, uh, in this video, uh, our, the second video is uh, dedicated to a religious tradition of the world. I want to speak about Confucianism, uh, or what in, is, is known as Zhuzhou. Confucianism, it's obviously a, a Western uh, uh, expression. It's an English word now, but it goes back to a, a Latin phrase, a Latin expression, Confucius. Um, but before I say a few words about Confucius and about Taoism in the next lecture, I want to just say a couple of, make a couple of comments about uh, religion in East Asia in general, uh, which would, of course, include Japan and uh, the Koreas um, and, uh, and, and China as well. And that is that in these contexts, uh, religion is, is, is naturally pluriform. Religion comes uh, in, in multiple channels, if you will. It's kind of like multitasking, religious multitasking. Now, this idea of religious multitasking is more familiar, I would say, to people in other parts of the world today than it was before. There's this new concept that religious studies scholars sometimes uh, use, the notion of multiple religious belonging. This is a way of talking about people who are are not just influenced by, but actually actively participate because of an inner sense of identification with more than one religious tradition. Um, I consider myself to be a person of multiple religious belonging, and there are a number of religious traditions that have impacted my life significantly over the last decades. That probably comes through even in, in my uh, unconscious selection of themes for these videos. But this is new, pretty much, in our part of the part of the world where I'm standing and speaking. Uh, it certainly wasn't the case in 1890 or 1920 or 1960. People had a religion. They were not members of two religions. Of course, it's always the case of converts and families with mixed marriages. But in general, people had a religion, and it wasn't the other religion. But in East Asia, religion is pluriform. And there have been a number of religious traditions in this part of the world that have interacted with each other gently sometimes and sometimes jostling with each other. And they, of course, in the case of China, they include uh, Taoism, Confucianism, uh, Buddhism, uh, and uh, indigenous uh, local religious traditions as well. And these uh, traditions... Uh, these uh, five traditions have, in, have interacted with each other now for thousands of years. In modern times, in more recent times, Islam, of course, uh, is present in China, especially in, in the Southwest, and uh, Christianity is a growing presence uh, in China now as well. But they don't form part of that traditional mix, although today they do, but they didn't traditionally. So let's keep that in mind as we move to, to the religion, uh, so religion in Japan. We'll speak a bit about religion in Japan as well. The same pattern will prevail. One scholar, John Bowker, uh, summed this up uh, some time ago as in these contexts that religion is not a single system of belief and practice. And I would restate that as religion is pluriform in these contexts. All right, so um, let's turn our attention for a few minutes to, uh, to Confucius. Uh, <laughs> Again, that's the Latin version of his name. But uh, his own formal title is uh, Kung Fu Tzu, uh, Master Kung. Uh, and uh, Fu Tzu means master or teacher. Uh, and uh, so actually, uh, we can say either Kung Fu Tzu or, or Confucius. I probably will go back and forth on, on, um, as we go along. There are central teachings, and in a moment I'll say something about that, and I'll say something about the most central and most innovative idea that, that really conferred a kind of immortality in China and now globally upon Kung Fu Tzu. But um, Kung Fu Tzu was really interested in the human realm. He was less interested in the traditional Chinese world of, of spirits and divinities. It wasn't that he was uninterested in them, and it, uh, it wasn't that he was dismissive of them, and it wasn't even that he was disrespecting of them. It's just that his focus was upon human conduct and human behavior. And thus, he one of his comments that was remembered by a student is that he advised his students to keep the spirits, to keep the divinities, to keep the gods and goddesses and the saints and the angels and the ancestrals, to keep them at a distance. This human focus, this humane interest 
of Confucius, which makes him even today such a magnetic uh, and, uh, and, and warmly influential figure, comes out in, in a story that was told uh, one time uh, he, after returning from a journey or uh, a walk, he was informed that the stables where he was living, uh, the stables of where the emperor's horses were stabled, had burned down. And Confucius, according to the story, had just returned from the court of the emperor. And his first question was, was anyone hurt? He didn't ask about the horses. Now, it seems that, in general, many people have thought, well, why didn't he think about the horses, the poor horses? Why did he think about people first? And, and that is a criticism that has been lodged. But in the context, it, what was actually occurring is that in that context, it's according to the commentators, the horses were more highly valued as the emperor's horses than the attendants of the horses. And while he wasn't unconcerned about the horses, he also was concerned about the people who took care of the horses. So that's why he first, his first concern was, did anybody get hurt? And uh, whether he did that consciously or not, it shows his focus upon, the, uh, upon human beings, upon the social dimension of life. So, um, I can spend an hour on this topic. I only have a few more minutes with you. What, what is at the very heart of Confucius's thought? Well, Confucius lived in a time that's conventionally referred to as the period of the warring states. And this was a time of, uh, of, of, of civil strife in China, uh, of civil war, civil war raging on multiple sides, warring warlords, uh, each conquering each other's territories and, 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 and inflicting great, uh, great um, uh, suffering upon uh, the people in the captured territories. It was a very difficult time in China, a time of great social breakdown, a, lack, a loss of civility, a loss of human kindness. Uh, and uh, we can see that this is a dangerous place to be for any society when the bands of civility begin to fray to the point where people stop recognizing the common humanity of fellow citizens. And so Confucius set himself to the task of restoring civility in a, in a society where these bonds, these bands of civility had been broken. And at the very heart of his thought, and in the minute or so that I have left with you, what his great innovation was to bring together two things that are often thought to be unrelated to each other, ethics on the one hand, or morality, and etiquette, or social customs on the other, uh, morals, and mores. He brought together ethical imperatives like uh, do not do to others what you don't want done to yourself, and etic matters of etiquette that in our context could be seen as whether you use your traffic signals or not when you're making a turn or, or which uh, utensil you use in which order uh, when sitting to uh, in a fine dining context or how one dresses in various contexts. Um, does one wear a tie when one visits the, the house of, say, the president of the United States, or does one go in, in gym clothes? These are questions that seem totally unrelated. What could ethics have to do with, with questions about social niceties? But it was Confucius's great insight that he recognized that while people are not so attentive, perhaps, to ethical imperatives, we are ultimately very sensitive to the cues we get from other people about our behavior. And he noted that when people flouted basic conventions, it was easier for them then to flout moral prescriptions. And so he went about the work of reforming people's everyday manners. In a way, uh, think about it for a moment if you're driving on a highway. And people, and this is the United States, so this is the driving habits peculiar to this part of the world where I'm talking right now, but it's different in other parts of the world. And in this case, if someone continuously rides in the outside lane at under the speed limit and people can pass, that can lead to road rage, and it often does. Now, it doesn't justify the road rage, but what it, said, it seems to indicate a lack of concern or care for the other person. And these small slights, they start to accumulate and they can create a mood of hostility towards other people. And this then becomes pretty dangerous if this starts to become a, a reflex that's expressed in how people treat each other socially, politically, 
it can lead to movements that can actually start to dehumanize other people. They say, well, that's a lot of weight to put on, you know, not using your blinkers in traffic. This is precisely the innovation of Confucius. He linked etiquette to ethics. And so, so uh, insightful was this that actually his influence in China uh, became uh, decisive and central. Sadly, not in his own lifetime, but later his disciples and his teaching became the founding philosophy uh, and social practice of China for the next two millennia.